And the reason we decided to do this series is because there is this idea somehow out there that if we can just really get good at something, or if, you know, if, if something just incredible happens uh, in our life, that our ordinary lives really become something very special. And uh, it's actually true, but it has nothing to do with a skill or a talent or an ability. It actually has to do with who God is and the fact that God made you and that God created you for something. And uh, God created you because he loved you and because God, in your ordinary life, God makes our lives really very extraordinary and very different because he comes into our life. So we're going to talk about this morning, um, the, uh, the lost art of becoming. It, it's, it's not lost with all people, but a lot of people do miss it. Uh, how do you become something uh, that you want to become and how does God plan that you would become something? And just to go back and review really quickly, last week we talked about five steps uh, for you to develop the, uh, this extra ordinary uh, life. And there are, there are five steps. In, in, in our series, it's going to be um, A, B, C, D, and E. And so we're, we're about to hit B. If you, uh, you want to try to guess the C, D, and E, I would, I would love for you to and try to send me what you think uh, those are. But um, we started out with the A represents, if you haven't looked at your outline, um, if the, the A represents what? Accepting something. Accepting what? God's love for you. Yeah, that's what the A represents. Accepting God's love for you. And it's a lot more difficult than you think. We all tend to hear how much God loves us. And so we say, well, yeah, I know that. But do you really know that? Is that really the driving force of your life? The fact that God created you, God loves you, God made you to love you. That was his plan and his purpose. And God wants you to rest in that love. God wants you to find your strength in that love. He wants you to find your significance in the fact that God created you and that God loves you. Our tendency, let's just be honest, mine also, is to try to get other people to love us. You know, Because if other people love me, then my life must be worth something. My life must be uh, significant. But it's actually the fact that God loves you that makes your life of incredible value to him and makes you worth something in life. And once you catch this, once you get this, and you begin to build your life upon God's love for you, it changes how you live your life. It frees you. Um, it causes you to interact with other people differently. You're not just interacting with people because you want something from them, but instead you have something to give to them because you understand just how much, just how much God loves you. Um, this is a verse we did last week, and uh, I, I think it's what's going to pop up next. Yes, it is. 1 John 3, 1. And I want you to kind of work on this one to memorize it. I think it's a great uh, memory verse, and I will read it uh, with you. If you want to read this with me, here it goes. Read this with me. See how great a love the Father has bestowed. This is from the New American Standard, older translation. And the reason I'm doing an older translation is because they tend to be more poetic, so you tend to remember them. I mean, that's why the King James is still loved and adored by so many people because there's a poetry to older language. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called, we would be called what? And then he goes on and adds what? And such we are. Literally, it just says, and we are in the translation. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called the children of God, the sons and daughters of God, his, his offspring, the ones, the ones that he has given life to. Now, now the, the problem is you're going to live in a world where a lot of people don't feel like children of God because even though they're made by God, they've not entered into this relationship uh, with God because they don't understand who Jesus Christ is and they haven't realized God's love for them, which comes through Christ himself. So they don't understand what you're talking about. They won't get it. In fact, the reality of it is when you go and say, you know, I just, I understand how much God loves me. That just changed me. They're going to look at you and say, that's really weird, right? Okay. And it is in some extent, if you don't understand it, if you don't, you haven't figured that part out, it is really weird because you're like, where is God? You know, so, so some force out there really loves you, but God becomes personal through Christ so that you understand just how much God loves you and that, that because of Christ, we are now related, we're tied in, we become his children. And, and as he says, and that's exactly who we are because God has done something 
to bring us to um, that relationship. Now, let, let me give you the second one. The B stands for um, become part of a family. It's, we're really talking about the church itself is this, is this family. Or I put in your outline, I left a blank for you to write the word belong, because that's what it is. Uh, you belong to some place. Now, here's the reality of it. You can say, I understand God's love for me. You can say, I relate to God's love for me. And you can then not have a family of other people that are part of that same family that understand the same thing that you go and you gather with, and you will struggle. Big time, you will struggle. I understand the other side of it. How many people that you've heard, maybe you're one of those people, that you would say, listen, I have no problem with God. I have no problem with Jesus, the church, people. I've got a big problem with. Anybody? Oh, yeah, or lift your hand because I'm, I'm lifting mine too. Of course, because that's the way it works. Listen, most of us understand that from just our earthly families. You know, the, the people that we get along with uh, sometimes in, in the worst way are our own siblings, you know, because we see them every day. We have to deal with them every day. The, the, the people from a distance are a lot easier to deal with than the people that you actually live with. But God had a plan in doing that because in this family, this is where love should take place and should be the most real in the midst of all of our struggles and failures and difficulties and, yes, our own sins, but that's the place. That's the place. I can tell you that um, my brother and sister and I had, had two siblings, and uh, we fought. Oh, my goodness, right? And uh, I would think, my brother would say the same thing, that my sister, Susan, that she got preferential treatment from my mom and dad, and we are right. She did. It was not fair. And two votes against one. We, we, we agreed to that. But we both love our sister dearly. And there's nothing that we won't do for our, for our sister. My older brother, I always love to talk about my older brother, Jack, three years older. And as I say, uh, Jack, you know, had his own struggles. One was his driving um, you know, he's not the best driver. And it, and, and it helps me because as I go down the road and I can get aggravated with drivers at times, I, I know you don't do that, but I, I can get aggravated with other drivers at times. And one of the things that pops in my mind often is when I do get aggravated, I, 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 in my mind, I say, that's somebody's older brother. <laughs> Even if it's not a man driving, I still think that's just, that's just how I see it because I realize if that were my brother, if that were Jack, I would give him a whole lot more slack, right? I, I would look at it differently because this is someone that I care about. This is someone that, I, that I'm family with. This is, this is my brother. And that kind of love changes us and it should change us. This is why if you look in the scripture, you, you know, even, even when Jesus asked, what's the greatest commandment? You remember what the greatest commandment was? He says, love the what? The Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And he said, and then there's a second that you cannot separate, it, uh, separate from it and love your what? Neighbor as yourself. Because he's, he's tying a love for God to a love for people. Not that the love for people causes us to love God. It's the opposite. It's our love for God that causes us to love people whom the Scripture says are made in His image. In fact, John even goes into this where he says, look, how can you say you love God who you cannot see and, and, and hate your brother who, who is made in the image of God who you can see? My thought is, you, you made my argument. That's the problem. You know, I can love God because I cannot see him. He's at a distance. And I'm like, I can put up with that. But this guy, Jack, my brother, he does things that irritate me at times. You know, we battle at times. It's difficult at times. Yes. That's how you learn love. <laughs> That's how you learn to love somebody and care for somebody despite their struggles and their difficulties. It doesn't mean that you, don't, that you say everything they do is right. That's not what it means to love someone. someone. Sometimes to love someone is to be absolutely honest with them, but let them know I'm not going anywhere, you know. I'm not bailing out. I'm not, not gonna. This is why I tell parents, because parents sometimes will get in, you know, in struggles uh, with their kids. Love your kids. It doesn't mean agree with everything. It doesn't mean don't discipline your children. It doesn't mean don't say, well, I don't think this would be the right, you know, I disagree with them, of course. 
but love them. And the reason is, and, and it, this is in the Bible too, it is the compassion of God that draws us to him. It's not the fact that God is righteous and never did anything wrong. That, that tends to repel us from God because we think, well, I, I can't meet that standard. But it's God's compassion for us that draws us to himself. In fact, the Bible says it is his compassion that draws us to repentance, to realize, okay. But if you, if you don't have a place to go, if you don't believe that God is someone who cares for you, why would you even admit your faults or your struggles or your difficulties if you don't believe that there's something greater than that that would, that would bring you back? Well, you wouldn't. You would cover them, which is what we do. You would ignore your difficulties, which is what we do. You would say, my problems, my struggles, my sins, they're not, there's nothing really wrong with those, which is what we do, because we have no place to go. But when there's a place to go, when you know that you're loved, then all of a sudden it's different. One of the things that Joni and I are the most proud about with our kids is that even when our kids did what they should not do, um, they messed up, they would still come back to us and tell us. You know, sometimes it took a while. <laughs> sometimes it was a really, really, really big struggle, struggle to come back and, and tell us, but they would come back and tell us. And the reason is because they knew we loved them more than anyone else loved them. So we'll find a way to get through this. We'll work through this. We will still, still be there with you. I have a, um, had a friend a long time ago. It's one of my favorite stories. And so if you've never heard it before, um, okay, you're going to sit for a while. No, not that long. It's, there's, there's a guy named Rich. And years and years and years ago, uh, I was serving at a church uh, down in Houston, very affluent on the southwest side of Houston in the Galleria area. So everybody that goes there and people that live there, you know, I mean, River Oaks is in this area and all the, you know, there's all this big, big money, successful people, aggressive people, highly educated people. I mean, this is, this is where we worked and ministered and this was part of my job. And here I was a, a guy from a little town in South Carolina, you know, that, that rode in on a pumpkin truck. And it was true. That, I mean, that was, you know, that was, the, that was the way it worked. But there was this guy named Rich, and he would show up. And I did, I did singles ministry uh, at the time. And all of a sudden, he started showing up because another guy that I knew started bringing him. I, let me tell you about Rich. Rich was uh, about six feet tall, and Rich weighed less than 120 pounds. And I know you think, is, is that thin? Yes, that's incredibly thin for a guy six feet tall. And the reason was because of his lifestyle and the things that he was in. He, he um, had a drug problem. He had an alcohol problem. All these things that, that took a lot of the life out of him. He was very, 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 very quiet. When he came, he wouldn't say a word to anyone. He didn't look like he belonged with people in this group. Uh, he didn't dress like he belonged with people in this group. Uh, he had no real idea or looking at you to try to say, you, sh you should accept me because I'm like you. And he would show up. And I still remember the first Sunday that he came with this friend of mine that he worked with him. Um, I, I said, not to him, but to someone else, he'll never come back. And the reason I said that was because I thought, well, he's going to look around and say, there's nobody here like me. Why, why would I come back to this place? And guess what? The next Sunday, guess who showed back up? You can say his name. Rich. He did. And so the next Sunday he showed up, still didn't say anything. He listened. Um, he, was, he was still apart. I noticed he was wearing the same clothes as when he came before. In fact, he had this shirt. Does anybody remember those shirts? There, they were, uh, some of them were made out of silk, the expensive, but most were made out of polyester, but they looked like a print of like, you know, uh, London or, you know, Amsterdam, you know, there was like a city print. Anybody remember those? Anybody wearing one today? So before I, okay, I just, you know, so the, they were really in at one time. And at this point when he would, he came, they had been really in about 10 years earlier. But here's what I understood. This was the best he had because every Sunday when I would see him, he would be wearing the same clothes and the same shirt that was way out of style, according to, you know, all the people that, that we were around. And, uh, you know, but he would still show up and he would show up. And every Sunday I would say, I would say it to my wife. Yeah, he, he won't be back next Sunday. He would be back. He, he won't be back next Sunday. He would be back. One Sunday, it was probably about this time of the year. He'd been coming uh, for about six months or so. And, um, I was, uh, had gone someplace really early that Sunday morning, had to come a different way. I'm driving. The heat is just like this. I'm driving in downtown Houston and uh, way before church, sun has come up and I see that shirt on the road, right? 
I know who it is. I know it's got to be rich. I pull over. I said, hey, you know, hop in. You know, I'm head to church. Yeah, you know, you know, ride with me because, you know, it's 100 degrees outside and, and it's Houston. And so you get in the car. So we would start uh, talking. And I'd already started to get to know him a, a little bit. But we start talking. I said, so, you know, tell me what's going on. He said, well, actually what happens is uh, because of the heat, I leave early and I walk so that I can get to the church an hour before everybody else gets there so that I can dry out in, you know, in time when everybody shows up so I will not be soaking wet. And he was pretty much already soaking wet even then. And so here, here we go. So he'd been doing it, and I'd, I'd been doing my predictions every Sunday, not coming back, not coming back. So, so I had to ask, I mean, why do you come back? You know, it's just to me the natural question. I wasn't, because I didn't want him to, I, so why do you come back? And this is what he said. I want you to think about this. He said, because I hear something about God and about Jesus. That if it's true, I can't walk away from it. I don't want to miss it. And he would come back every, every Sunday, every Sunday to hear the message of how much God loved him and how God had sent his son Jesus Christ for him. And if that were true, that would radically change his whole impression of himself. I never met his family. I'm not even sure if he had any relatives or parents that knew him or whatever. Came from a really, really, you know, poor, you know, difficult uh, place in life that, that he didn't, you know, talk about much because he wouldn't think you'd be interested in it. But he was hearing a message. He was hearing something about a heavenly father that loved him and something about a savior, Jesus Christ, who came and gave his life for rich because he loved rich. But let me explain to you, if he doesn't come back to the same place every week where there are people who are a mess also, who, who a lot of people, you know, where I'm from, they thought they were important because of how much money they had or, you know, of their, their education or some particular skill. That's what they're basing their life on. They never fully got what he got early on, which is what makes it so important, so important that a guy like that shows up because Rich's life changed over those years dramatically. I, when the last time I saw Rich, Rich was about 170 pounds, so he had 50-something pounds heavier. He, he, he looked totally different. His hair looked totally different. His complexion was totally different. He no longer wore that shirt. I don't know what happened to that shirt, but he no longer wore that shirt. He had other clothes. He fit in. He was still his own personality, very quiet. We would go on um, um, vacations together. I mean, the group that I worked with, with the single adults, sometimes there'd be a couple hundred people, and we'd go skiing together. We'd rent out a whole place. He would be there. He's going. He's saving up his money. He's going with the group. He's, he attends the, the, a small group with some other guys. He got, I mean, he was just a part of everything, and it was absolutely amazing. In fact, probably one of the things that sticks with me more than anything else to watch him grow in his understanding of how much God loved him. That was the focal point of his life, and I belong. This is my family. These are people. They're not like me socially. They, they weren't educated like me. They didn't have the same, you know, upbringing that I did, but we have the same father and we have the same love that motivates us. And his life was absolutely radically changed by that relationship. Last time I saw Rich, he was married, had a kid, had a really good job, did really well for himself, still quiet and one of the most compassionate people that you would ever make. Not, not outwardly, he didn't aggressively go after people, you know, to, to be compassionate and loving, but he was compassionate. When I first met him, probably three or four months before I ever saw him smile, probably in the car, when the first time I ever saw him, uh, saw him smile, now he smiles all the time. I'm not talking about walking around with some fake grin on his face. He just realized his life had dramatically changed. A lot of that has to do with belonging. The reason I share that is because, listen, there are a lot of people, and somehow they get the idea that they can grow in their relationship with God, they can grow close to God, and God's love will be their strength, but they don't need other people. Big mistake. Big mistake. It will not work because in the family is where you learn to get along. In the family is where you learn to deal with issues and struggles that you have. It's not a perfect place. Oh, my goodness. What were we thinking? When someone says, man, there are a lot of hypocrites in the church, you say, yes, I'm one of them, right? 
But we, we learn to love each other. We learn to grow together in the midst of all of these struggles and all of these difficulties because, because of how much God loves us. That's what motivates us. That's what gets us through things. That's what unites us together. You know, that if you've been around me, you know I would say this all the time. People say we are, we are strong because of our, uh, or they'll say we're united because of our diversity. What are you thinking? That's, that, that's the most nonsensical statement in the world. No one is united by their diversity. <laughs> we're united despite our diversity. We're united by something greater than our diversity. We're united by something that pulls us together even though we're not all alike. We don't come from the same backgrounds. We are jealous of each other. We struggle with each other. But there's something greater than that, and that's the way it's supposed to work because in a group like this, you say, why would they do this? Why would they come together? And it's an evidence of something greater than who we are that actually, actually pulls us together and uh, keeps us together. So let me give you just uh, five or six points uh, this morning only um, on this. And first of all, about belonging and about uh, becoming, this art of becoming. First of all, the family, where you come and you worship together and you gather because of who Christ is, the family legitimizes who you are. You, you are a son or a daughter of God because you belong to the family. That's part of it. And, and if, you, if you're not a part of the family, it would cause someone to say, mm, not so sure that they are who they say they are. This is, what, this is what draws you in. Here's what it says in John chapter 13. This is Jesus, his words. So now I'm giving you, say this with me, now I'm giving you a what? New commandment. This was not given to the world. This is a new commandment to, to Jesus' followers, to his family, those, especially those 12 that were with him. Now I'm giving you a new commandment because he's, he's about to leave in this passage. This is all uh, John, about half of John is, is the last couple of weeks of Jesus' life. Here's his commandment. Do what? Love each other. And he, he, he quantifies it. He says, listen, love each other just as I have loved you, you should love each other. In other words, Jesus loved them. He cared for them. And, and they, had, they had experienced this. And he's saying the same love that you have experienced from me, love one another the same way. Care for one another the same way. And then verse 35, he says this. Here we go. He says, your love for one another will what? Will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Your love for one another will prove that you understand how much God loves you. The lo your love for one another will prove you're in the same family. You believe these are my brothers and sisters because we have the same Father. We've been rescued by the same Savior. That, that's, that's the proof of it. I put uh, two more in here. Uh, healthy growth doesn't happen in isolation. It doesn't. I'm not saying there aren't times when you are isolated or times when you need to go away and be by yourself along with God. Those are important times for you to contemplate things, for you to grow together. I mean, Jesus went for 40 days when he started out in, into the wilderness. But in order to grow, you cannot just live an isolated life. Now, it's, I know it's hard. And I know it's a struggle sometimes. It's easier just to be isolated. And especially in our, in our culture with, you know, cell phones and televisions and computers and things where you can live by yourself and just be hooked to a false idea that you have relationship because you don't have relationship. You're just being entertained or interacting in that way. You have to have, you have, to have relationship to grow. Number three, I put on here, uh, you're more, more vulnerable uh, without your church family. I'm not saying vulnerable in the sense that when you're, when you're around your family, they know your weaknesses, right? My wife knows my weaknesses, and surprisingly, she loves me anyway. <laughs> That's what makes the love so evident. She knows and she loves me anyway. I'm not talking about that kind of vulnerability that's in the relationship. I'm saying that it makes you more vulnerable if you're isolated to the things that you, that you experience in the world, to being down, to being um, discouraged in life because you have no one there to help you and to strengthen you uh, and to lift you up. Here's what it says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Uh, the writer says, Remember your leaders who taught you the Word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow their example 
are the example of their faith. That, that's because in relationship, you have those that you can look to and you can follow after them. Look at verse 17. I know you think the preacher's putting this out. Here we go. Verse 17, obey your leaders. Submit to them. Yes. <laughs> For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable to you if, you know, if they're really struggling. Uh, years ago, I'm walking into a 7-Eleven, and there's two boys as I'm going in. I would say no, uh, no older than maybe 13 years old. As I walk by, uh, there's a rail there. They're leaning against it, and, and out of one of their mouths as they're talking together, pretty loud, uh, there are all these profanities that, that come out. I mean, just like, whoa. I mean, I, you know, it was hard for me to believe a 13-year-old knew these words, certainly that he would boldly say them in public around other people and all. And I, 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 I reacted. Probably should not have reacted. Dangerous thing to do sometimes, right? But I just stopped. I, it's kind of hit me real quick. And I said, hey, did your mama teach you to talk like that? Now, that's dangerous, you know. He might have said something about my mama, you know, or something like that. You know, I don't, you, know you don't know how somebody's going to react. But you know what his reaction was? He immediately said, no, sir, she didn't. Totally different kid all of a sudden when I brought up his mom in the, in, in the conversation. And, then, and then, then I went on. Totally different. You know why? Because this kid probably had a mom that loved him and cared for him and had more experience than he did in life and would teach him something different. Because what happens with a kid, I'll give you a little bit of child psychology. With a kid, you use big words that are beyond you and they sound like adult words and they're profane and things like that. And it makes you feel bigger, more important than you really are. It impresses your peers. But when you bring mom up, mom is not impressed at all. <laughs> in fact, mom knows where this leads to and how this kind of false sense of who you are is a very dangerous thing in life. You need to understand who you are. You need to understand, and that's what, that's, I guarantee he had a mom that was teaching him, trying to teach him who he really was. So that he would build his life on things that mattered, that counted, that he could build his life upon. And she would not be happy with his language, right? She would not set an example for that kind of language. She, she would discipline him if she heard that kind of language. Why? Because she, what? Loved her son. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's one of the reasons you need a family. I need a family. Because we need someone to help correct us at times. We need someone to set a different example at times in our lives. We need to be in a place where we know if we get out of line, somebody who cares for me, someone who it's important to them, is going to step up and say, hey, you don't want to go there. In schools, you see this all the time. You see kids who do not believe that there's someone who cares for them act up in public settings where there are adults. Why? Because they're acting out the fact that they do not believe there's someone who really does love and care for them. And they're trying to get discipline and attention and a reaction because they don't really believe they matter anywhere else. Probably the worst thing you can do to anyone is to act as if or teach them that what they do doesn't matter. They will lose self-respect. They will lose dignity when you do this. Terrible thing to take away from any person. Instead, the truth helps anyone, especially spoken in love, to understand that, uh, that their life really does count and their life really doesn't matter. Here's number four. Your church family helps you develop your giftedness. And it is true. Uh, you have gifts. You have skills. And this is a place in a family uh, this is a, a family also, the church is, where you can develop those gifts and skills. Here's what it says in Ephesians chapter 4. It's pretty lengthy. Let me read this for you. Verse number 11 says, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The church means to his family, the people in his family. And he, he did it for a reason. Here's the gifts. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, uh, the pastors and teachers. This is not all the gifts. He's, just, he's using these for, for a reason. Verse 12, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and to build up the church, the body of Christ, this, the family. This will continue 
until we all come to such unity, and it means until we grow up to, the, to our faith and knowledge of God's Son that will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of who Christ is, right? That's what we're growing up to. We're, we just have to be growing as a, as a family in that direction. Verse 14, he says, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown. Catch this. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new te teaching. That means tricked, deceived by what we hear. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts. Say that with me. Helps them do what? Yeah, that means I need you, you need me if we're going to grow. So that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of what? It, it doesn't mean we smile all the time, right? It just means we're real. And that, that the love that we have is real and genuine. Somebody reminded me this week, they had to go get a passport and... uh one of the things they tell you when you do your passport picture is, anybody know, don't what? Don't smile. Yeah. Because they want the picture to look like you really are. Because <laughs> the custom agent is not going to see you smiling. Maybe you could throw them off by going, it's not you, you know. Yeah, they want to know you as you really are. So that there's a real love and a real care in the family for who you are, your giftedness, your ability, your skills, all those things, and then in the family, even as people who are not a part of the family, who God wants them to understand, to accept His love for them and become a part, so that they realize, they recognize, hmm, something about that, something about being a part of that, that family. Here's number five, your church family safeguards your soul. It, it really does. Here's what uh, in Galatians uh, Paul is writing uh, uh, to, the, to the believers there, and he says, Dear brothers and sisters, if, if another believer is overcome by some sin, and he's not taking this lightly, he says, you, are God, you who are godly should gently and humbly help the person back on the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way, obey the law of Christ, because this is what Jesus did for us. If you think you are too important, I love this verse. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. <laughs> you're not that important. That sounds like the golf video, right? You're not that good, right? You're not that. No, you, th no one is so important that you can't help someone who is struggling or someone, someone else who's going through a uh, a difficulty. Here's the last one. Number six, your church family is a continuing witness to the world. I, I love um, in Jesus' prayer, this is recorded, John records it in the 17th chapter. This is what Jesus says during his prayer. He says, I'm praying not only for these disciples, that was the ones right in front of him, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. You know who is included in that? Who? Us, right. We're, we're part of that. So it's not only, he's not only talking about other believers who might be in a different location at this time. He's talking about other believers who might be in a different time. We are almost 2,000 years later after this time, and he is including us in the family when he says this. He's saying to his disciples, you're part of a family. You have no idea how extensive the family is going to be and, and, and the family that is to come. We're, we're part of the family with them. And then he says this in, in verse 21. He says, I pray that they will all be, right? Those there, those 2,000 years later, they'll always be what? One. Well, how can that happen? How, how could we be one? We don't live in Palestine. We didn't live 2,000 years ago. We couldn't live at that, uh, at that time. I pray that they all be one, just as you and I, he's talking to the Father, as we are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us, 
so that, here we go, so that the world will believe that you sent who? Me. Jesus is saying, I pray that they would all be one, that, that we, 2,000 years ago, there would be a connection even between us and the disciples 2,000 years earlier, that there would be like a family and a oneness so that the world around us would still look and see that and see this connection. We believe the same things. We hold to the same things at their core. We're not the same people. We don't live in the same culture they did. But there's this, this strong love and this unity that pulls us together as a witness to the world around us who God desperately loves and desperately wants them to understand how much he loves them so that they would look around and say, there might be something to this. Maybe God is trying to do something for me just like he did something for them. Maybe there's a place for me in this family, this local family, just like there was a place for those people 2,000 years ago in that local family who believed and built their life on the same thing, on the love of the Father that came through the Son to reach down to us and say, listen, you are loved. God wants you to be a part. There's a family that has been created for you. It's more than your biological family. This is a family built on faith. This is a supernatural structure to this family and a supernatural existence to this family, which makes your life and my life and those who will even come after us absolutely incredible because they will be part of something that is so much bigger than just themselves, just their own life. Would you pray with me this morning? And as we pray together, if you're here and you've never put your hope and your faith in Jesus Christ, may, maybe you just didn't get it before. Maybe, maybe like a lot of people, you've just heard how much God loves you so many times it just kind of goes over your head. You never really realized why God loved you and what God wanted to do for you. How God wanted to change your, your entire perspective of life. Your whole perspective on other people totally changed it through His Son, Jesus Christ. I can't think of anything that would be more powerful for your life or more important than for you to be a person in your own way, how you got there, like Rich, who's, who heard a message, who realized, if this is true, I want this. I can't not show up. I can't walk away. If, if this is true, this is absolutely life-changing. If God really did send His Son into the world, Jesus Christ, and if Jesus did live a perfect life, even though He went through every struggle, every difficulty that I would go through, He went through a life just like I've had to go through, but if, if Jesus was able to stay on track, to hold His ground, to be the, 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 the perfect person, all because he wanted to give his life to rescue me. I can't ignore that. I, I can't go back to just living my life the way it was before, if that's true. And if God rescued all these other people, even though they may not look like me, they may not dress like me, they may not come from the same a socioeconomic background that I did, if, if God rescues them and wants to rescue me also and place us in the same family, I want that. And that comes through Jesus' Son. Lord Jesus, thank you for saving us, rescuing us from, from a, a meaningless life, just a haphazard life of chasing things and doing things that never really satisfy, that never, never really bring the significance that we're looking for. But instead, you showed us how much you loved us, how much you wanted us by forgiving us of our sins and giving us a new life and a new family. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.